balance. A lot of bands that I hear uh, when I adjudicate, they sound like lawnmower in A. Because there's not a delineation of parts and relative importance and interchanging of roles that's happening. It's just and it may be tidy, in tune, uh, in style, in rhythm, but it's a musical. So ask your beginning band, who has the melody? Raise your hand. Let's hear the melody. Don't tell them who has the melody. Ask them. Get them to use their, as Miss Green would say, Elizabeth A.H. Green. She would say, oh, you band guys. And you knew it wasn't going to be good. <laughs> oh, you band guys, you're so good at teaching the lips and the fingers. When are you going to discover teaching the brain? And you know, I had no idea what she meant. Giving concepts rather than solving the symptoms of something. Teach the concept. But yes, they can find out who has the melody, even if the tuba player plays when the melody plays. They figure out, oh, that's not the melody. And they usually drop out. You don't have to tell them. And, and then I, I like to go a lot further and say, how many of you think that you have the second most important part? You don't have the melody, but you're, you think your part's pretty important. Let's hear those guys play. Or you can say, raise your hands and say, I agree. I think it's the horn saxophone line. Let's hear that. Now let's put that together with the melody and try to achieve some kind of balance between the roles that you think you're supposed to play. Now, how many of you think you have the third most important part? This is getting easier in some ways because some of you haven't played yet. It's also getting harder because this is a value judgment. We won't all do the same balance. That's why if you knew the work intimately of William D. Ravelli, Harry Beejan, Albert Austin Harding, Frederick Fennell, etc., 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 you could listen to the first four measures of every movement of Lincolnshire and you would know whose band that is. Personal choices that are different. They jump out at us. So we're going to make different choices. There's not right and wrong. It's part of what makes us unique. And now you can say, all right, everybody who's not been assigned a melody, second most, third most important, and least important part, raise your hand. Now, tubas, you can raise your hand. All right? And then you go back and put it together and, and there starts to be a delineation of balance. And then we discuss with fifth graders the conversational aspect of music. If you're speaking, I'm going to listen. I'm going to look you in the eye. I'm still part of the conversation. But this conversation is not Jerry Springer. This is a civilized, intelligent conversation. We don't throw chairs. You may have the least most important part, but at some point it becomes the most important part. You may be nodding in the conversation, paying attention, contributing, supporting, and then you have that's more important than the melody. Students then start to use their ears rather than um, us telling them what to do. When in the next piece, we have to tell them what to do again. The next piece, next one, and they are learning not much. Asking them questions about phrase length. I had to do this at Michigan State with graduate students. Graduate students are still middle school kids in older bodies. I mean, they. They are, and hopefully you and I are too. 
It would be great. Owen Reed, great composer, taught at Michigan State for 38 years, just celebrated his 100th birthday, June 17th. He's the oldest middle school male on the planet. He is. But how long do you think this phrase is here? How many of you think it's two measures? How many of you think it's four? What about eight? It's interesting that none of you raised your hand um, after two measures, but you know, a lot of you just took a breath there. Were you breathing because you needed to breathe or was it an, an artistic decision? Okay, would you please consider? That's a lot better than what I used to do is say, Mark, the phrases here and breathe here. You can tell fifth graders, seventh graders, ninth graders how to stagger breathe. And you don't have to keep telling them how to stagger breathe. If the principal player on each part, first, second, and third part, says, should we stagger breathe here? I, I can't make this phrase. Yes, that's a good idea. Thank you. Then the principal player puts their initials where they're going to breathe and they show their stand partner where they're breathing and they have to put their initials somewhere else. And we end up with people breathing at different times and stagger breathing. Uh, we don't need to do that for them. We need to teach them how to do it once. I remember at Ann Arbor Huron, one day after um, it was, I was getting ready for the, the Monday rehearsal after football season. And to many of us in our profession, the first concert rehearsal, indoor rehearsal, is a religious holiday. It's spiritual. And we look forward to that, as do the students. We, we love marching band in the fall, but when it's time to go, and particularly in Michigan with the weather, to go inside and put on real clothes, to have a thermostat that's set at a comfortable temperature, to play your real instruments with a real music stand. It, it, so that whole weekend, you know, we're all just terribly excited. I couldn't wait. It was gonna be so fantastic. You know the feeling. Well, the kids were glad to be inside too. And they were social, more social than I thought they should be. Do you know the book uh, 42 Corrals um, arranged, I think by Philip Gordon? It's a terrific corral book. And uh, I knew that I should be giving the students time on their own rather than me telling them what to do. So I said, okay, we're gonna sight read corral number one. You have 30 seconds to look it over, go. You know, most of them didn't look at the music. They talked. And the longer that 30 seconds went, the more angry I became. They were damaging. It was sacrilegious what they were doing. And so I did something I hadn't done before. I said, all right, close your books. And no one closed their book. I said, close the book. Angry. And they closed their book. And I said, what key is it in, Joe? Well, Joe knew the key. Everybody knew the key, and they were feeling pretty good, you know? <laughs> and I'd say, um, Rick, who wrote it? Nobody got who wrote it. And so I just out of anger, lashed out at them, and I said, during what historical period was this written? Name four other composers that might have written this Baroque chorale. What is polyphony? And now they're angry at me. So we read number one, went on with the rehearsal. Fast forward 24 hours to Tuesday, and I said, all right, we're going to sight read number two. You have 30 seconds go. It's a different band. We like games. We like to be challenged. We like to know what the rules are. And this band was all over this music. I mean, they were getting stuff off the page and they're talking to each other. And, and I close the books. And they got everything that I'd asked them yesterday and I kept 
escalating. Are there any accidentals in any measures on what nodes? Are there any accidentals that repeat inside a measure on what nodes? In what measure? Are there, are there any repeats in the piece from where to where? And once again, they were kind of, you know. Well, the game took on a life of its own. At the end of about two weeks, they could tell me how many notes were on their page. The year that it was uh, written, the year that this p published version was copyrighted. I mean, more stuff than I, I could think to ask. One of my favorite seniors, a trumpet player, sometime in week two, after we had done our 30-second quiz, raised his hand, which no one had done before. And I said, yes. He said, we have really come to enjoy this little game, and we understand why you're doing it, and we think it's great. We like it. So in the spirit of that, we know you will understand when we ask you to close your book. I, I had to close the book, and it was brutal. I mean, it was just brutal. But that was the beginning of the best sight-reading bands that I had, and it spilled over to lots of things that we did, because it wasn't my job anymore to give them the information. It was their job to get it off the page. So I think I think finding ways, and sometimes we fall into them by mistake. I think we don't use the parents enough. Um, so just very briefly, in about one minute, let's talk about the parents. As a young teacher, I didn't know enough. I wasn't old enough to know that I could ask the parents to assist in certain ways. I was younger than all those parents. But they're still looking to us, even if you're a first-year teacher, to tell them what their role in the process is. So if you think about everything that a parent can do, the encouraging, supporting, um, they want the very best for their children. We all do. And when they hire us to be the music professional in our community, it's our obligation to include them and, and use that resource. So um, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for the opportunity of coming back to Florida and to see all my ASBDA friends again. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have this great wind ensemble come up and get ready for their concert.